chapter thirteen of abraham lincoln a history volume ten this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume ten by john hay and john george nicolay chapter thirteen the capture of jefferson davis when jefferson davis and the remnant of the confederate cabinet with the more important of their department archives left richmond on the night of april two in consequence of lee's retreat they proceeded to danville southwest of richmond arriving there the following morning in a conference between davis and lee in which the probability of abandoning richmond was discussed they had agreed upon this point at which to endeavor to unite the armies of lee and johnston first to attack and beat sherman and then return and defeat grant but grant so far from permitting lee to execute the proposed junction did not even allow him to reach danville lee had been pressed so hard that he had not found opportunity to inform davis where he was going and this absence of news probably served to give davis an intimation that their preconcerted plans were not likely to reach fulfilment nevertheless the rebel president made a show of confidence rooms were obtained and he says the different departments resumed their routine labors though it may be doubted whether in these labors they earned the compensation which the confederate states promised them two days after his arrival at danville jefferson davis added one more to his many rhetorical efforts to fire the southern heart on the fifth he issued a proclamation in which after reciting the late disasters in as hopeful a strain as possible he broke again into his never-failing grandiloquence we have now entered upon a new phase of the struggle relieved from the necessity of guarding particular points our army will be free to move from point to point to strike the enemy in detail far from his base let us but will it and we are free animated by that confidence in your spirit and fortitude which never yet failed me i announce to you fellow-countrymen that it is my purpose to maintain your cause with my whole heart and soul that i will never consent to abandon to the enemy one foot of the soil of any of the states of the confederacy that virginia noble state whose ancient renown has been eclipsed by her still more glorious recent history whose bosom has been bared to receive the main shock of this war whose sons and daughters have exhibited heroism so sublime as to render her illustrious in all time to come that virginia with the help of the people and by the blessing of providence shall be held and defended and no peace ever be made with the infamous invaders of her territory if by the stress of numbers we should be compelled to a temporary withdrawal from her limits or those of any other border state we will return until the baffled and exhausted enemy shall abandon in despair his endless and impossible task of making slaves of a people resolved to be free in his book davis is frank enough to admit that this language in the light of subsequent events may fairly be said to have been over sanguine he probably very soon reached this conviction for almost before the ink was dry on the document a son of general henry a wise escaping through the federal lines on a swift horse brought him information of the surrender of lee's army to grant rumor also reaching him that the federal cavalry was pushing southward west of danville the confederate government again hastily packed its archives into a railroad train and moved to greensboro north carolina its reception at this place was cold and foreboding the headquarters of the government remained on the train at the depot only jefferson davis and secretary trenholm who was ill were provided with lodgings from this point davis sent a dispatch to general johnston soliciting a conference either at greensboro or at the general's headquarters and in response to this request johnston went without delay to greensboro arriving there on the morning of april twelve within an hour or two both generals 
johnston and beauregard were summoned to meet the confederate president in a council of war there being also present the members of the rebel cabinet namely benjamin secretary of state mallory secretary of the navy and regan postmaster-general the meeting was held in a room some twelve by sixteen feet in size on the second floor of a small dwelling and contained a bed a few chairs and a table with writing materials the infatuation under which davis had plunged his section into rebellion against the government pitting the south with its disparity of numbers and resources against the north still beset him in the hour of her collapse and the agony of her surrender he had figured out how the united armies of lee and johnston could successively demolish sherman and grant but he could not grasp the logic of common sense that by the same rule the united armies of grant and sherman would make short work of johnston alone whenever they could reach him the spirit of obstinate confidence with which he entered upon the interview may be best inferred from the description of it written by the two principal actors themselves davis says i did not think we should despair we still had effective armies in the field and a vast extent of rich and productive territory both east and west of the mississippi whose citizens had evinced no disposition to surrender ample supplies had been collected in the railroad depots and much still remained to be placed at our disposal when needed by the army in north carolina my motive therefore in holding an interview with the senior generals of the army in north carolina was not to learn their opinion as to what might be done by negotiation with the united states government but to derive from them information in regard to the army under their command and what it was feasible and advisable to do as a military problem johnston's statement shows still more distinctly how impossible it was for davis to lay aside the airs of dictator we had supposed that we were to be questioned concerning the military resources of our department in connection with the question of continuing or terminating the war but the president's object seemed to be to give not to obtain information for addressing the party he said that in two or three weeks he would have a large army in the field by bringing back into the ranks those who had abandoned them in less desperate circumstances and by calling out the enrolled men whom the conscript bureau with its forces had been unable to bring into the army neither opinions nor information was asked and the conference terminated pollard the southern historian is probably not far wrong in saying that this was an interview of inevitable embarrassment and pain the two generals johnston and beauregard were those who had experienced most of the prejudice and injustice of the president he had always felt aversion for them and it would have been an almost impossible excess of christian magnanimity if they had not returned something of resentment and coldness to the man who they believed had arrogantly domineered over them and more than once sought their ruin now when davis without even the preface of asking their opinions bade these two men resuscitate his military and political power and transform him from a fugitive to a commander-in-chief it is not to be wondered at that the interview terminated without result matters were thus left in an awkward situation for all parties the rebel chief had no promise of confidence or support the generals no authority to negotiate or surrender the cabinet no excuse to intervene by advice or protest to either party this condition was however opportunely relieved by the arrival during the afternoon of the secretary of war breckinridge who was the first to bring them the official and undoubted intelligence of the surrender of lee with his whole army of which they had hitherto been informed only by rumor and which they had of course hoped to the last moment might prove unfounded the fresh news naturally opened up another discussion and review of the emergency between the various individuals and seems at length to have brought them to a frank avowal of their real feelings to each other in private johnston and beauregard holding military council together agreed in the opinion that the southern confederacy was overthrown 
this opinion johnston also repeated to breckinridge and mallory both of whom it would seem entertained the same view the absence of anything like full confidence and cordial intimacy between davis and his advisers is shown by the fact that these two members of his cabinet were unwilling to tell their chief the truth which both recognized and urged upon general johnston the duty of making the unwelcome suggestion that negotiations to end the war should be commenced breckinridge promised to bring about an opportunity and it was evidently upon his suggestion that davis called together a second conference of his cabinet and his generals there is a conflict of statement as to when it took place both davis and mallory in their accounts grouped together all the incidents as, as if they occurred at a single meeting which mallory places on the evening of the twelfth while johnston's account mentions the two separate meetings the first on the morning of the twelfth and the second on the morning of the thirteenth there being however substantial agreement between all as to the points discussed of this occasion so full of historical interest we fortunately have the records of two of the participants general johnston writes being desired by the president to do it we compared the military forces of the two parties to the war ours an army of about twenty thousand infantry and artillery and five thousand mounted troops those of the united states three armies that could be combined against ours which was insignificant compared with either grants of one hundred and eighty thousand men sherman's of one hundred and ten thousand at least and canby's of sixty thousand odds of seventeen or eighteen to one which in a few weeks could be more than doubled i represented that under such circumstances it would be the greatest of human crimes for us to attempt to continue the war for having neither money nor credit nor arms but those in the hands of our soldiers nor ammunition but that in their cartridge boxes nor shops for repairing arms or fixing ammunition the effect of our keeping the field would be not to harm the enemy but to complete the devastation of our country and ruin of its people i therefore urged that the president should exercise at once the only function of government still in his possession and open negotiations for peace the members of the cabinet present were then desired by the president to express their opinions on the important question general breckinridge mr mallory and mr regan thought that the war was decided against us and that it was absolutely necessary to make peace mr benjamin expressed the contrary opinion the latter made a speech for war much like that of sempronius in addison's play secretary mallory's account is even more full of realistic vividness he represents davis after introducing the dreaded topic by several irrelevant subjects of conversation and coming finally to the situation of the country as saying of course we all feel the magnitude of the moment our late disasters are terrible but i do not think we should regard them as fatal i think we can whip the enemy yet if our people will turn out we must look at matters calmly however and see what is left for us to do whatever can be done must be done at once we have not a day to lose a pause ensued general johnston not seeming to deem himself expected to speak when the president said we should like to hear your views general johnston upon this the general without preface or introduction his words translating the expression which his face had worn since he entered the room said in his terse concise demonstrative way as if seeking to condense thoughts that were crowding for utterance my views are sir that our people are tired of the war feel themselves whipped and will not fight our country is overrun its military resources greatly diminished while the enemy's military power and resources were never greater and may be increased to any desired extent we cannot place another large army in the field and cut off as we are from foreign intercourse i do not see how we could maintain it in fighting condition if we had it my men are daily deserting in large numbers and are taking my artillery teams to aid their escape to their homes since lee's defeat they regard the war as at an end if i march out of north carolina her people will all leave my ranks it will be the same 
as i proceed south through south carolina and georgia and i shall expect to retain no man beyond the by-road or cow-path that leads to his house my small force is melting away like snow before the sun and i am hopeless of recruiting it we may perhaps obtain terms which we ought to accept the tone and manner almost spiteful in which the general jerked out these brief decisive sentences pausing at every paragraph left no doubt as to his own convictions when he ceased speaking whatever was thought of his statements and their importance was fully understood they elicited neither comment nor inquiry the president who during their delivery had sat with his eyes fixed upon a scrap of paper which he was folding and refolding abstractedly and who had listened without a change of position or expression broke the silence by saying in a low even tone what do you say general beauregard i concur in all general johnston has said he replied another silence more eloquent of the full appreciation of the condition of the country than words could have been succeeded during which the president's manner was unchanged davis's optimism had taken an obstinate form and even after these irrefutable arguments and stern decisions he remained unconvinced he writes that he never expected a confederate army to surrender while it was able either to fight or to retreat but sustained only by the sophomoric eloquence of mr benjamin he had no alternative he inquired of johnston how terms were to be obtained to which the latter answered by negotiation between military commanders proposing that he should be allowed to open such negotiations with sherman to this davis consented and upon johnston's suggestion secretary mallory took up a pen and at davis's dictation wrote down the letter to sherman which we have quoted elsewhere and the results of which have been related the council of war over general johnston returned to his army to begin negotiations with sherman on the following day april fourteen davis and his party without waiting to hear the result left greensboro to continue their journey southward the dignity and resources of the confederate government were rapidly shrinking railroad travel had ceased on account of burned bridges and it could no longer even maintain the state enjoyed in its car at greensboro we are not informed what became of the archives its personnel president cabinet and sundry staff officers scraped together a lot of miscellaneous transportation composed of riding horses ambulances and other vehicles which over roads rendered almost impassable by mud made their progress to the last degree vexatious and toilsome the country was so full of fugitives that horse-stealing seems to have become for the time an admitted custom and privilege we have the statement of davis's private secretary that eight or ten young mississippians one of them an officer who volunteered to become the rebel president's bodyguard equipped themselves by pressing the horses of neighboring farmers rendering necessary a premature and somewhat sudden departure in advance of the official party obtaining shelter by night when they could and camping at other times the distinguished fugitives made their way to charlotte north carolina where they arrived on the eighteenth of april since the confederate government had considerable establishments at charlotte orders were dispatched to the quartermaster to prepare accommodations and this request was reasonably satisfied for all the members of the party except its chief the quartermaster met them near the town and explained that though quarters could be furnished for the rest of us he had as yet been able to find only one person willing to receive mr davis saying the people generally were afraid that whoever entertained him would have his house burned by the enemy that indeed it was understood threats to that effect had been made everywhere by stoneman's cavalry there seemed to be nothing to do but to go to the one domicile offered it was on the main street of the town and was occupied by mr bates a man said to be of northern birth a bachelor of convivial habits the local agent of the southern express company apparently living alone with his negro servants and keeping a sort of open house where a broad well-equipped sideboard was the most conspicuous feature of the situation not at all a seemly place for mr davis mr davis was perforce obliged to accept this entertainment and whether he failed to realize the significance of such treatment or whether he 
was moved by his suppressed indignation to a defiant self-assertion when a detachment of rebel cavalry passing along the street saluted him with cheers and called him out for a speech after the usual compliments to soldiers he expressed his own determination not to despair of the confederacy but to remain with the last organized band upholding the flag and this feeling he again emphasized during his stay in charlotte by a remark to his private secretary i cannot feel like a beaten man the stay at charlotte was prolonged evidently to wait for news from johnston's army no information came till april twenty three when breckinridge secretary of war arrived bringing the memorandum agreement made by sherman and johnston on the eighteenth the memorandum seems to have been discussed at a cabinet meeting held on the morning of the twenty fourth and mr davis yielded to the advice they all gave him to accept and ratify the agreement he wrote a letter to that effect but almost immediately received further information which sherman communicated to johnston that the washington authorities had rejected the terms and agreement and directed sherman to continue his military operations and that sherman had given notice to terminate the armistice this change coupled with the news of the assassination of president lincoln which the party had received on their arrival in charlotte stimulated the hopes of the rebel president and he sent back instructions to johnston to disband his infantry and retreat southward with so much of his cavalry and light artillery as he could bring away against the daily evidence of his own observation and the steady current of advice from his followers he was still dreaming of some romantic or miraculous renewal of his chances and fortunes and in his book written fifteen years afterward he makes no attempt to conceal his displeasure that general johnston refused to obey his desperate and futile orders the armistice expired on the twenty sixth and the fugitive confederate government once more took up its southward flight at starting the party still made show of holding together there were the president most of the members of the cabinet several staff officers and fragments of six cavalry brigades counting about two thousand which had escaped in small parties from johnston's surrender this was enough to form a respectable escort there was still talk of the expedition turning westward and making its way across the mississippi to join kirby smith and magruder but the meagre accounts plainly indicate that davis's advisers fed his hope for politeness sake or to furnish the only pastime with which it was possible to relieve the tedium of their journey for as they proceeded the expedition melted away as if by enchantment davis directed his course toward abbeville south carolina mr mallory records that though they had met no enemy at abbeville the fragments of disorganized cavalry commands which had thus far performed in some respects an escort's duty were found to be reduced to a handful of men anxious only to reach their homes as early as practicable and whose services could not further be relied on almost every cross-road witnessed the separation of comrades in arms who had long shared the perils and privations of a terrific struggle now seeking their several homes to resume their duties as peaceful citizens the members of the cabinet except regan also soon dropped off on various pretexts benjamin decided to pursue another route breckinridge remained behind with the cavalry at the crossing of the savannah river and never caught up at washington georgia a little further on mallory halted to attend to the needs of his family davis waited a whole day at washington and finding that neither troops nor leaders appeared the actual situation seems at last to have dawned upon him i spoke to captain campbell of kentucky commanding my escort he writes explained to him the condition of affairs and telling him that his company was not strong enough to fight and too large to pass without observation asked him to inquire if there were ten men who would volunteer to go with me without question wherever i should choose with these two officers three members of his personal staff and postmaster general regan he pushed ahead still nursing his project of crossing the mississippi river
davis's private secretary had been sent ahead to join mrs davis and her family party at abbeville south carolina and they continued their journey in advance with a comfortable wagon train after passing washington and georgia reports of pursuit by federal cavalry increased and a more ominous rumor gained circulation that a gang of disbanded confederates was preparing to plunder the train under the idea that it carried a portion of the official treasure apprehension of this latter danger induced the confederate president to hurry forward and overtake his family and during three days he travelled in their company it seems to have been a dismal journey the roads were bad heavy storms were prevailing signs of danger and prospects of capture were continually increasing and they were sometimes compelled to start at midnight and push on through driving rain to make good their concealed flight they halted about five o'clock in the afternoon of may nine to camp and rest in the pine woods by a small stream in the neighborhood of irwinville irwin county near the middle of southern georgia here the situation was discussed and it became clear that any hope of reaching the trans mississippi country was visionary the determination was finally arrived at to proceed to the east coast of florida and by means of a small sailing vessel stated to be in readiness endeavor to gain the texas coast by sea it was also agreed that davis should at once leave his family and push ahead with a few companions davis explains that he and his special party did not start ahead at nightfall as had been arranged because a rumor reached him that the expected rebel marauders would probably attack the camp that night and that he delayed his departure for the protection of the women and children still intending however to start during the night with this view his own and other horses remained saddled and ready but the camp was undisturbed and fatigue seems to have held its inmates in deep slumber until dawn of may ten when by a complete surprise a troop of federal cavalry suddenly captured the whole party and camp there is naturally some variance in the accounts of the incident but the differences are in the shades of colouring rather than in the essential facts two expeditions had been sent from macon by general james h wilson in pursuit of jefferson davis and his party the one to scour the left the other the right bank of the okmulgee river one under lieutenant colonel henry harnden commanding the first wisconsin cavalry starting on the sixth and the other under lieutenant colonel b d pritchard commanding the fourth michigan cavalry starting on the seventh of may following different routes these two officers met at the village of abbeville georgia in the afternoon of may nine where they compared notes and decided to continue the pursuit by different roads as the chase grew hot smaller detachments from each party spurred on learned the location of the slumbering camp and posted themselves in readiness to attack it at daylight but remained unconscious of each other's proximity the fugitives camp was in the dense pine woods a mile and a half north of irwinville pritchard had reached this village after midnight obtained information about the camp and procured a negro boy to guide them to it approaching to within half a mile he halted both to wait for daylight and to send his lieutenant puritan with twenty-five dismounted men to gain the rear of the camp but cautioning him that a part of harnden's command would in all probability approach from that direction and that he must avoid a conflict with them at daybreak writes captain g w lawton of pritchard's force the order was passed in a whisper to make ready to enter the camp the men were alive to the work mounting their horses the column moved at a walk until the tents came in sight and then at the word dashed in the camp was found pitched on both sides of the road on the left hand as we entered were wagons horses tents and men on the right were two wall tents fronting from the road all was quiet in the camp we encountered no guards if there were any out they must have been asleep just at this instant however firing was heard back of the camp where purinton had been sent this created instant confusion and pritchard with most of his force rushed forward through the camp to resist a supposed confederate attack it turned out that despite the precautions taken the detachment of pritchard's men under purinton the fourth michigan had met a detachment of harnden's men the first wisconsin and in the darkness they had mistaken and fired on each other causing two deaths and wounding a number 
the rush of the cavalry and the firing of course aroused the sleepers and as they emerged from their tents there was a moment of confusion during which only one or two federal soldiers remained in the camp one of these had secured davis's horse which had stood saddled since the previous evening and which a colored servant had just brought to his tent of what ensued we give mr davis's own account i stepped out of my wife's tent and saw some horsemen whom i immediately recognized as cavalry deploying around the encampment i turned back and told my wife these were not the expected marauders but regular troopers she implored me to leave her at once i hesitated from unwillingness to do so and lost a few precious moments before yielding to her importunity my horse and arms were near the road on which i expected to leave and down which the cavalry approached it was therefore impracticable to reach them i was compelled to start in the opposite direction as it was quite dark in the tent i picked up what was supposed to be my raglan a waterproof light overcoat without sleeves it was subsequently found to be my wife's so very like my own as to be mistaken for it as i started my wife thoughtfully threw over my head and shoulders a shawl i had gone perhaps fifteen or twenty yards when a trooper galloped up and ordered me to halt and surrender to which i gave a defiant answer and dropping the shawl and raglan from my shoulders advanced toward him he levelled his carbine at me but i expected if he fired he would miss me and my intention was in that event to put my hand under his foot tumble him off on the other side spring into his saddle and attempt to escape my wife who had been watching when she saw the soldier aim his carbine at me ran forward and threw her arms around me success depended on instantaneous action and recognizing that the opportunity had been lost i turned back and the morning being damp and chilly passed on to a fire beyond the tent colonel pritchard relates in his official report upon returning to camp i was accosted by davis from among the prisoners who asked if i was the officer in command and upon my answering him that i was and asking him whom i was to call him he replied that i might call him what or whomsoever i pleased when i replied to him that i would call him davis and after a moment's hesitation he said that was his name he suddenly drew himself up in true royal dignity and exclaimed i suppose that you consider it bravery to charge a train of defenceless women and children but it is theft it is vandalism that the correctness of the report may not be questioned we add the corroborating statement of postmaster general regan the sole member of the rebel cabinet remaining with the party colonel pritchard did not come up for some time after mr davis was made a prisoner when he rode up there was a crowd chiefly of federal soldiers around mr davis he was standing and dressed in the suit he habitually wore he turned toward colonel pritchard and asked who commands these troops colonel pritchard replied without hesitation that he did mr davis said to him you command a set of thieves and robbers they rob women and children colonel pritchard then said mr davis you should remember that you are a prisoner and mr davis replied i am fully conscious of that it would be bad enough to be the prisoner of soldiers and gentlemen i am still lawful game and would rather be dead than be your prisoner colonel pritchard's official report gives the following list of the persons who fell into his hands i ascertained that we had captured jefferson davis and family a wife and four children john h regan his postmaster general colonels harrison and lubbock a d c to davis burton n harrison his private secretary major maurin and captain moody lieutenant hathaway jeff d howell midshipmen in the rebel navy and twelve private soldiers miss maggie howell sister of mrs davis two waiting-maids one white and one black and several other servants we also captured five wagons three ambulances about fifteen horses and from twenty-five to thirty mules the train was mostly loaded with commissary stores and private baggage of the party the details of the return march are unnecessary there is no allegation that the prisoners were ill-treated they arrived at macon on may thirteenth both captors and prisoners having on the way first learned of the offer of a reward of one hundred thousand dollars for davis's apprehension on the charge of having been an accomplice in the assassination of president lincoln
the assumption of davis's guilt and the proclamation offering the reward were not based upon mere public excitement but upon testimony given by witnesses who appeared before the bureau of military justice and which seemed conclusively to prove that the rebel president had taken part in that dreadful conspiracy but this evidence was found to be untrustworthy upon an investigation held by a committee of congress about a year later several of these witnesses retracted their statements and declared that their testimony as given originally was false in every particular no prosecution on this charge was therefore begun against davis but after an imprisonment of about two years in fort monroe he was indicted and arraigned at richmond before the united states circuit court for the district of virginia for the crime of treason and liberated on bail horace greeley garrett smith and cornelius vanderbilt having volunteered to become his principal bondsmen on the third of december eighteen hundred and sixty eight a motion was made to quash the indictment on the ground that the penalties and disabilities denounced against and inflicted on him for his alleged offence by the third section of the fourteenth amendment of the constitution of the united states were a bar to any proceedings upon such indictment the court consisting of chief justice chase and judge john c underwood considered the motion and two days later announced that they disagreed in opinion and certified the question to the supreme court of the united states though not announced it was understood that the chief justice held the affirmative and judge underwood the negative three weeks from that day president johnson bestowed upon mr davis and those who had been his followers a liberal and fraternal christmas gift on the twenty fifth of december eighteen hundred and sixty eight he issued a proclamation supplementing the various prior proclamations of amnesty which declared unconditionally and without reservation to all and to every person who directly or indirectly participated in the late insurrection or rebellion a full pardon and amnesty for the offence of treason against the united states or of adhering to their enemies during the late civil war with restoration of all rights privileges and immunities under the constitution and the laws which have been made in pursuance thereof the government of course took no further action in the suit and at a subsequent term of the circuit court the indictment was dismissed on motion of mr davis's counsel the ex-president of the confederate states was thus relieved from all penalties for his rebellion except the disability to hold office imposed by the third section of the fourteenth amendment which congress refused to remove this ended the public career of jefferson davis he returned to his home in mississippi where he lived unmolested nearly a quarter of a century after the downfall of his rebellion emerging from his retirement only by an occasional letter or address in some of these as well as in his elaborate work entitled the rise and fall of the confederate government very guarded undertones revealed an undying animosity to the government of the united states whose destiny he had sought to pervert whose trusts he had betrayed whose honours he had repaid by attempting its destruction and whose clemency he appeared incapable of appreciating even in his defeat he died at new orleans on december sixth eighteen hundred and eighty nine while visiting that city End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of abraham lincoln a history volume ten this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by warren cotty gurney illinois abraham lincoln a history volume ten by john hay and john george nicolay chapter fourteen the fourteenth of april the fourteenth of april was a day of deep and tranquil happiness throughout the united states it was good friday observed by a portion of the people as an occasion of fasting and religious meditation but even among the most devout the great tidings of the preceding week exerted their joyous influence and changed this period of traditional mourning into an occasion of general and profound thanksgiving peace so strenuously fought for so long sought and prayed for with prayers uttered and unutterable was at last near at hand 
its dawn visible on the reddening hills the sermons all day were full of gladness the miseraries turned of themselves to tedeums the country from morning till evening was filled with a solemn joy but the date was not to lose its awful significance in the calendar at night it was claimed once more and forever by a world-wide sorrow the thanksgiving of the nation found its principal expression at charleston harbor a month before after sherman had conquered charleston by turning his back upon it the government resolved that the flag of the union should receive a conspicuous reparation on the spot where it had first been outraged it was ordered by the president that general robert anderson should at the hour of noon on the fourteenth day of april raise above the ruins of fort sumter the identical flag lowered and saluted by him four years before in the absence of general sherman the ceremonies were in charge of general gilmore henry ward beecher the most famous of the anti-slavery preachers of the north was selected to deliver an oration the surrender of lee the news of which arrived at charleston on the eve of the ceremonies gave a more transcendent importance to the celebration which became at once the occasion of a national thanksgiving over the downfall of the rebellion on the day fixed charleston was filled with a great concourse of distinguished officers and citizens its long deserted streets were crowded with an eager multitude and gay with innumerable flags while the air was thrilled from an early hour with patriotic strains from the many bands and shaken with the thunder of dahlgren's fleet which opened the day by firing from every vessel a national salute of twenty-one guns by eleven o'clock a brilliant gathering of boats ships and steamers of every sort had assembled around the battered ruin of the fort the whole bay seemed covered with the vast flotilla planted with a forest of masts whose foliage was the triumphant banners of the nation the rev matthias harris the same chaplain who had officiated at the raising of the flag over sumter at the first scene of the war offered a prayer dr richard s stores and the people read in alternate verses a selection of psalms of thanksgiving and victory beginning with these marvellous words which have preserved for so many ages the very pulse and throb of the joy of redemption when the lord turned again the captivity of zion we were like them that dream then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing then said they among the heathen the lord hath done great things for them the lord hath done great things for us whereof we are glad turn again our captivity o lord as the streams in the south they that sow in tears shall reap in joy he that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing bringing his sheaves with him and at the close before the gloria the people and the minister read all together in a voice that seemed to catch the inspiration of the hour some trust in chariots and some in horses but we will remember the name of the lord our god we will rejoice in thy salvation and in the name of our god we will set up our banners general townsend then read the original dispatch announcing the fall of sumter and precisely as the bells of the ships struck the hour of noon general anderson with his own hands seizing the halyards hoisted to its place the flag which he had seen lowered before the opening guns of rebellion as the starry banner floated out upon the breeze which freshened at the moment as if to embrace it a storm of joyful acclamation burst forth from the vast assembly mingled with the music of hundreds of instruments the shouts of the people and the full-throated roar of great guns from the union and the captured rebel forts alike on every side of the harbor thundering their harmonious salute to the restored banner general anderson made a brief and touching speech 
the people sang the star-spangled banner mr beecher delivered an address in his best and gravest manner filled with an earnest sincere and unboastful spirit of nationality with a feeling of brotherhood to the south prophesying for that section the advantages which her defeat has in fact brought her a speech as brave as gentle and as magnanimous as the occasion demanded in concluding he said and we quote his words as they embodied the opinion of all men of good will on this last day of abraham lincoln's life quote, we offer to the president of these united states our solemn congratulations that god has sustained his life and health under the unparalleled burdens and sufferings of four bloody years and permitted him to behold this auspicious consummation of that national unity for which he has waited with so much patience and fortitude and for which he has labored with such disinterested wisdom Unquote. at sunset another national salute was fired the evening was given up to social festivities the most distinguished of the visitors were entertained at supper by general gilmore a brilliant show of fireworks by admiral dahlgren illuminated the bay and the circle of now friendly forts at the very moment when at the capital of the nation a little group of conspirators were preparing the blackest crime which sullies the record of the century in washington also it was a day not of exaltation but of deep peace and thankfulness it was the fifth day after the surrender of lee the first effervescence of the intoxicating success had passed away the president had with that ever-present sense of responsibility which distinguished him given his thoughts instantly to the momentous question of the restoration of the union and of harmony between the lately warring sections he had in defiance of precedent and even of his own habit delivered to the people on the eleventh from the windows of the white house his well-considered views as to the measures demanded by the times his whole heart was now enlisted in the work of binding up the nation's wounds of doing all which might achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace grant had arrived that morning in washington and immediately proceeded to the executive mansion where he met the cabinet friday being their regular day of meeting he expressed some anxiety as to the news from sherman which he was expecting hourly the president answered him in that singular vein of poetic mysticism which though constantly held in check by his strong common sense formed a remarkable element in his character he assured grant that the news would come soon and come favorably for he had last night his usual dream which preceded great events he seemed to be he said in a singular and indescribable vessel but always the same moving with great rapidity towards a dark and indefinite shore he had had this dream before antietam murfreesboro gettysburg and vicksburg the cabinet were greatly impressed by this story but grant the most matter-of-fact of created beings made the characteristic response that murphy's borough was no victory and had no important results the president did not argue this point with him but repeated that sherman would beat or had beaten johnston that his dream must relate to that as he knew of no other important event which was likely at present to occur the subject of the discussion which took place in the cabinet on that last day of lincoln's firm and tolerant rule has been preserved for us in the notes of mr wells they were written out it is true seven years afterwards at a time when grant was president seeking re-election and when mr wells had followed andrew johnson into full fellowship with the democratic party making whatever allowance is due for the changed environment of the writer we still find his account of the day's conversation candid and trustworthy the subject of trade between the states was the first that engaged the attention of the cabinet mr stanton wished it to be carried on under somewhat strict military supervision mr wells was in favor of a more liberal system mr mcculloch new to the treasury 
and embarrassed by his grave responsibilities favored the abolition of the treasury agencies and above all desired a definite understanding of the purpose of the government the president seeing that in this divergence of views among men equally able and honest there lay the best chance of a judicious arrangement appointed the three secretaries as a commission with plenary power to examine the whole subject announcing himself as content in advance with their conclusions the great subject of the re-establishment of civil government in the southern states was then taken up mr stanton had a few days before drawn up a project for an executive ordinance for the preservation of order and the rehabilitation of legal processes in the states lately in rebellion the president using this sketch as his text not adopting it as a whole but saying that it was substantially the result of frequent discussions in the cabinet spoke at some length on the question of reconstruction than which none more important could ever engage the attention of the government it was providential he thought that this matter should have arisen at a time when it could be considered so far as the executive was concerned without interference by congress if they were wise and discreet they should reanimate the states and get their governments in successful operation with order prevailing and the union re-established before congress came together in december the president felt so kindly towards the south he was so sure of the cabinet under his guidance that he was anxious to close the period of strife without overmuch discussion he was particularly desirous to avoid the shedding of blood or any vindictiveness of punishment he gave plain notice that morning that he would have none of it Quote, no one need expect he would take any part in hanging or killing these men even the worst of them frighten them out of the country open the gates let down the bars scare them off said he throwing up his hands as if scaring sheep enough lives have been sacrificed we must extinguish our resentments if we expect harmony and union Unquote. he deprecated the disposition he had seen in some quarters to hector and dictate to the people of the south who were trying to right themselves he regretted that suffrage under proper arrangement had not been given to negroes in louisiana but he held that their constitution was in the main a good one he was averse to the exercise of arbitrary powers by the executive or by congress congress had the undoubted right to receive or reject members the executive had no control in this but the executive could do very much to restore order in the states and their practical relations with the government before congress came together mr stanton then read his plan for the temporary military government of the states of virginia and north carolina which for this purpose were combined in one department this gave rise at once to extended discussion mr wells and mr dennison opposing the scheme of uniting two states under one government the president closed the session by saying the same objection had occurred to him and by directing mr stanton to revise the document and report separate plans for the government of the two states he did not wish the autonomy or the individuality of the states destroyed he commended the whole subject to the most earnest and careful consideration of the cabinet it was to be resumed on the following tuesday it was he said the great question pending they must now begin to act in the interest of peace these were the last words that lincoln spoke to his cabinet they dispersed with these words of clemency and good will in their ears never again to meet under his wise and benignant chairmanship he had told them that morning a strange story which made some demand upon their faith but the circumstances under which they were next to come together were beyond the scope of the wildest fancy the day was one of unusual enjoyment to mr lincoln his son robert had returned from the field with general grant and the president spent an hour with the young captain in delighted conversation over the campaign 
he denied himself generally to the throng of visitors admitting only a few friends schuyler colfax who was contemplating a visit overland to the pacific came to ask whether the president would probably call an extra session of congress during the summer mr lincoln assured him that he had no such intention and gave him a verbal message to the mining population of colorado and the western slope of the mountains concerning the part they were to take in the great conquests of peace which were coming in the afternoon he went for a long drive with mrs lincoln his mood as it had been all day was singularly happy and tender he talked much of the past and the future after four years of trouble and tumult he looked forward to four years of comparative quiet and normal work after that he expected to go back to illinois and practice law again he was never simpler or gentler than on this day of unprecedented triumph his heart overflowed with sentiments of gratitude to heaven which took the shape usual to generous natures of love and kindness to all men from the very beginning of his presidency mr lincoln had been constantly subject to the threats of his enemies and the warnings of his friends the threats came in every form his mail was infested with brutal and vulgar menace mostly anonymous the proper expression of vile and cowardly minds the warnings were not less numerous the vaporings of village bullies the extravagances of excited secessionist politicians even the drolling of practical jokers were faithfully reported to him by zealous or nervous friends most of these communications received no notice in cases where there seemed a ground for inquiry it was made as carefully as possible by the president's private secretary and by the war department but always without substantial result warnings that appeared to be most definite when they came to be examined proved too vague and confused for further attention the president was too intelligent not to know he was in some danger madmen frequently made their way to the very door of the executive offices and sometimes into mr lincoln's presence he had himself so sane a mind and a heart so kindly even to his enemies that it was hard for him to believe in a political hatred so deadly as to lead to murder he would sometimes laughingly say our friends on the other side would make nothing by exchanging me for hamlin the vice-president having the reputation of more radical views than his chief he knew indeed that incitements to murder him were not uncommon in the south an advertisement had appeared in a paper of selma alabama in december eighteen sixty four opening a subscription for funds to effect the assassination of lincoln seward and johnson before the inauguration there was more of this murderous spirit abroad than was suspected a letter was found in the confederate archives from one lieutenant alston who wrote to jefferson davis immediately after lincoln's re-election offering to quote, rid his country of some of her deadliest enemies by striking at the very heart's blood of those who seek to enchain her in slavery unquote. this shameless proposal was referred by mr davis's direction to the secretary of war and by judge campbell assistant secretary of war was sent to the confederate adjutant general endorsed quote, for attention unquote. we can readily imagine what reception an officer would have met with who should have laid before mr lincoln a scheme to assassinate jefferson davis it was the uprightness and the kindliness of his own heart that made him slow to believe that any such ignoble fury could find a place in the hearts of men in their right minds although he freely discussed with the officials about him the possibilities of danger he always considered them remote as is the habit of men constitutionally brave and positively refused to torment himself with precautions for his own safety he would sum the matter up by saying that both friends and strangers must have daily access to him in all manner of ways and places his life was therefore in reach of any one sane or mad 
who was ready to murder and be hanged for it that he could not possibly guard against all danger unless he were to shut himself up in an iron box in which condition he could scarcely perform the duties of a president by the hand of a murderer he could die only once to go continually in fear would be to die over and over he therefore went in and out before the people always unarmed generally unattended he would receive hundreds of visitors in a day his breast bare to pistol or knife he would walk at midnight with a single secretary or alone from the executive mansion to the war department and back he would ride through the lonely roads of an uninhabited suburb from the white house to the soldier's home in the dusk of evening and return to his work in the morning before the town was astir he was greatly annoyed when it was decided that there must be a guard stationed at the executive mansion and that a squad of cavalry must accompany him on his daily ride but he was always reasonable and yielded to the best judgment of others four years of threats and boastings of alarms that were unfounded and of plots that came to nothing thus passed away but precisely at the time when the triumph of the nation over the long insurrection seemed assured and a feeling of peace and security was diffused over the country one of the conspiracies not seemingly more important than the many abortive ones ripened in the sudden heat and hatred of despair a little band of malignant secessionists consisting of john wilkes booth an actor of a family of famous players lewis powell alias payne a disbanded rebel soldier from florida george atzerott formerly a coachmaker but more recently a spy and blockade runner of the potomac david e harold a young druggist's clerk samuel arnold and michael o'loughlin maryland secessionists and confederate soldiers and john h surratt had their ordinary rendezvous at the house of mrs mary e surratt the widowed mother of the last named formerly a woman of some property in maryland but reduced by reverses to keeping a small boarding-house in washington booth was the leader of the little coterie he was a young man of twenty-six strikingly handsome with a pale olive face dark eyes and that ease and grace of manner which came to him of right from his theatrical ancestors he had played for several seasons with only indifferent success his value as an actor lay rather in his romantic beauty of person than in any talent or industry he possessed he was a fanatical secessionist he assisted at the capture and execution of john brown and had imbibed at richmond and other southern cities where he had played a furious spirit of partisanship against lincoln and the union party after the re-election of mr lincoln which rang the knell of the insurrection booth like many of the secessionists north and south was stung to the quick by disappointment he visited canada consorted with the rebel emissaries there and at last whether or not at their instigation cannot certainly be said conceived a scheme to capture the president and take him to richmond he spent a great part of the autumn and winter inducing a small number of loose fish of secession sympathies to join him in this fantastic enterprise he seemed always well supplied with money and talked largely of his speculations in oil as a source of income but his agent afterwards testified that he never realized a dollar from that source that his investments which were inconsiderable were a total loss the winter passed away and nothing was accomplished on the fourth of march booth was at the capitol and created a disturbance by trying to force his way through the line of policemen who guarded the passage through which the president walked to the east front of the building his intentions at this time are not known he afterwards said he lost an excellent chance of killing the president that day there are indications in the evidence given on the trial of the conspirators that they suffered some great disappointment in their schemes in the latter part of march and a letter from arnold to booth 
dated March 27, showed that some of them had grown timid of the consequences of their contemplated enterprise and were ready to give it up. He advised Booth, before going further, quote, to go and see how it will be taken in R-D, unquote. But, timid as they might be by nature, the whole group was so completely under the ascendancy of Booth that they did not dare disobey him when in his presence, and after the surrender of Lee, in an access of malice and rage which was akin to madness, he called them together and assigned each his part in the new crime, the purpose of which had arisen suddenly in his mind out of the ruins of the abandoned abduction scheme. This plan was as brief and simple as it was horrible. Powell, alias Payne, the stalwart, brutal, simple-minded boy from Florida, was to murder Seward. Atzerodt, the comic villain of the drama, was assigned to remove Andrew Johnson. Booth reserved for himself the most difficult and most conspicuous role of the tragedy. It was Harold's duty to attend him as a page and aid in his escape. Minor parts were assigned to stage carpenters and other hangers-on, who probably did not understand what it all meant. Harold, Atzerat, and Surratt had previously deposited at a tavern in Surrattsville, Maryland, owned by Mrs. Surratt, but kept by a man named Lloyd, a quantity of ropes, carbines, ammunition, and whiskey, which were to be used in the abduction scheme. On the 11th of April, Mrs. Surratt, being at the tavern, told Lloyd to have the shooting irons in readiness, and on Friday, the 14th, again visited the place and told him they would probably be called for that night. The preparations for the final blow were made with feverish haste. It was only about noon of the 14th that Booth learned the president was to go to Ford's theater that night. It has always been a matter of surprise in Europe that he should have been at a place of amusement on Good Friday. But the day was not kept sacred in America, except by the members of certain churches. It was not, throughout the country, a day of religious observance. The president was fond of the theater. It was one of his few means of recreation. It was natural enough that, on this day of profound national thanksgiving, he should take advantage of a few hours' relaxation to see a comedy. Besides, the town was thronged with soldiers and officers, all eager to see him. It was represented to him that appearing occasionally in public would gratify many people whom he could not otherwise meet. Mrs. Lincoln had asked General and Mrs. Grant to accompany her. They had accepted, and the announcement that they would be present was made as an advertisement in the evening papers, but they changed their minds and went north by an afternoon train. Mrs. Lincoln then invited in their stead Miss Harris and Major Henry R. Rathbone, the daughter and the stepson of Senator Ira Harris. The President's carriage called for these young people, and the four went together to the theater. The President had been detained by visitors, and the play had made some progress when he arrived. When he appeared in his box, the band struck up, Hail to the Chief. The actors ceased playing and the audience rose, cheering tumultuously. The president bowed in acknowledgment of this greeting, and the play went on. From the moment Booth ascertained the president's intention to attend the theater in the evening, his every action was alert and energetic. He and his confederates, Harold, Surratt, and Atzerodt, were seen on horseback in every part of the city. He had a hurried conference with Mrs. Surratt before she started for Lloyd's Tavern. He entrusted to an actor named Matthews a carefully prepared statement of his reasons for committing the murder, which he charged him to give to the publisher of the National Intelligencer, but which Matthews, in the terror and dismay of the night, burned without showing to anyone. Booth was perfectly at home in Ford's Theatre, where he was greatly liked by all the employees, without other reason than the sufficient one of his youth and good looks. Either by himself or with the aid of his friends, he arranged his whole plan of attack and escape during the afternoon. 
he counted upon address and audacity to gain access to the small passage behind the president's box once there he guarded against interference by an arrangement of a wooden bar to be fastened by a simple mortise in the angle of the wall and the door by which he entered so that the door could not be opened from without he even provided for the contingency of not gaining entrance to the box by boring a hole in its door through which he might either observe the occupants or take aim and shoot he hired a delivery stable a small fleet horse which he showed with pride during the day to barkeepers and loafers among his friends the moon rose that night at ten o'clock a few minutes before that hour he called one of the underlings of the theater to the back door and left him there holding his horse he then went to a saloon near by took a drink of brandy and entering the theater passed rapidly through the crowd in the rear of the dress circle and made his way to the passage leading to the president's box he showed a card to a servant in attendance and was allowed to pass in he entered noiselessly and turning fastened the door with the bar he had previously made ready without disturbing any of the occupants of the box between whom and himself there yet remained the slight partition and the door through which he had bored the hole their eyes were fixed upon the stage the play was our american cousin the original version by tom taylor before southern had made a new work of it by his elaboration of the part of dundreary no one not even the comedian on the stage could ever remember the last words of the piece that were uttered that night the last abraham lincoln heard upon earth the whole performance remains in the memory of those who heard it a vague phantasmagoria the actors the thinnest of spectres the awful tragedy in the box makes everything else seem pale and unreal here were five human beings in a narrow space the greatest man of his time in the glory of the most stupendous success in our history the idolized chief of a nation already mighty with illimitable vistas of grandeur to come his beloved wife proud and happy a pair of betrothed lovers with all the promise of felicity that youth social position and wealth could give them and this young actor handsome as endymion upon latmus the pet of his little world the glitter of fame happiness and ease was upon the entire group but in an instant everything was to be changed with the blinding swiftness of enchantment quick death was to come on the central figure of that company the central figure we believe of the great and good men of the century over all the rest the blackest fates hovered menacingly fates from which a mother might pray that kindly death would save her children in their infancy one was to wander with a stain of murder on his soul with the curses of a world upon his name with a price set upon his head in frightful physical pain till he died a dog's death in a burning barn the stricken wife was to pass the rest of her days in melancholy and madness of those two young lovers one was to slay the other and then end his life a raving maniac the murderer seemed to himself to be taking part in a play partisan hate and the fumes of brandy had for weeks kept his brain in a morbid state he felt as if he were playing brutus off the boards he posed expecting applause holding a pistol in one hand and a knife in the other he opened the box door put the pistol to the president's head and fired dropping the weapon he took the knife in his right hand and when major rathbone sprang to seize him he struck savagely at him major rathbone received the blow on his left arm suffering a wide and deep wound booth rushing forward then placed his left hand on the railing of the box and vaulted lightly over to the stage it was a high leap but nothing to such a trained athlete he was in the habit of introducing what actors call sensational leaps in his plays in macbeth where he met the weird sisters he leaped from a rock twelve feet high 
he would have got safely away but for his spur catching on the folds of the union flag with which the front of the box was draped he fell on the stage the torn flag trailing on his spur but instantly rose as if he had received no hurt though in fact the fall had broken his leg he turned to the audience brandishing his dripping knife and shouting the state motto of virginia sic semper tyrannis and fled rapidly across the stage and out of sight major rathbone had shouted stop him the cry went out he has shot the president from the audience at first stupid with surprise and afterwards wild with excitement and horror two or three men jumped upon the stage in pursuit of the flying assassin but he ran through the familiar passages leaped upon his horse which was in waiting in the alley behind rewarded with a kick and a curse the call-boy who had held him and rode rapidly away in the light of the just risen moon the president scarcely moved his head drooped forward slightly his eyes closed colonel rathbone at first not regarding his own grievous hurt rushed to the door of the box to summon aid he found it barred and on the outside some one was beating and clamoring for entrance he opened the door a young officer named crawford entered one or two army surgeons soon followed who hastily examined the wound it was at once seen to be mortal it was afterwards ascertained that a large derringer bullet had entered the back of the head on the left side and passing through the brain had lodged just behind the left eye by direction of rathbone and crawford the president was carried to a house across the street and laid upon a bed in a small room at the rear of the hall on the ground floor mrs lincoln followed half distracted tenderly cared for by miss harris rathbone exhausted by loss of blood fainted and was carried home messengers were sent for the members of the cabinet for the surgeon general for dr robert k stone the president's family physician a crowd of people rushed instinctively to the white house and bursting through the doors shouted the dreadful news to robert lincoln and major hay who sat gossiping in an upper room mr nicolay being absent at charleston at the flag raising over sumter they ran downstairs finding a carriage at the door they entered it to go to tenth street as they were driving away a friend came up and told them that mr seward and most of the cabinet had been murdered the news was all so improbable that they could not help hoping it was all untrue but when they got to tenth street and found every thoroughfare blocked by the swiftly gathering thousands agitated by tumultuous excitement they were prepared for the worst in a few minutes those who had been sent for and many others were gathered in the little chamber where the chief of the state lay in his agony his son was met at the door by dr stone who with grave tenderness informed him that there was no hope after a natural outburst of grief young lincoln devoted himself the rest of the night to soothing and comforting his mother the president had been shot a few minutes past ten the wound would have brought instant death to most men but his vital tenacity was extraordinary he was of course unconscious from the first moment but he breathed with slow and regular respiration throughout the night as the dawn came and the lamplight grew pale in the fresher beams his pulse began to fail but his face even then was scarcely more haggard than those of the sorrowing group of statesmen and generals around him his automatic moaning which had continued through the night ceased a look of unspeakable peace came upon his worn features at twenty-two minutes after seven he died stanton broke the silence by saying quote, now he belongs to the ages unquote. dr gurley kneeled by the bedside and prayed fervently the widow came in from the adjoining room supported by her son and cast herself with loud outcry on the dead body.
End of chapter 14. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurnee, Illinois. Chapter 15 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 10. By John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 15 the fate of the assassins booth had done his work efficiently his principal subordinate the young floridian called payne had acted with equal audacity and cruelty but not with equally fatal result he had made a shambles of the residence of the secretary of state but among all his mangled victims there was not one killed at eight o'clock that night he received his final orders from booth who placed in his hands a knife and revolver and a little package like a prescription and taught him a lesson payne was a young man hardly of age of herculean strength a very limited mental capacity blindly devoted to booth who had selected him as the fitting instrument of his mad hatred he obeyed the orders of his fascinating senior as exactly and remorselessly as a steel machine at precisely the moment when booth entered the theater payne came on horseback to the door of mr seward's residence on lafayette square dismounting he pretended to be a messenger from the attending physician with a package of medicine and demanded immediate access to the sick room of the secretary mr seward had been thrown from his carriage a few days before and his right arm and jaw were fractured the servant at the door tried to prevent payne from going up the stairs but he persisted and the noise the two men made in mounting brought his son frederick w seward out into the hall the secretary had been very restless and had with difficulty at last been composed to sleep fearing that this restorative slumber might be broken frederick seward came out to check the intruders he met payne at the head of the stairs and after hearing his story bade him go back offering himself to take charge of the medicine payne seemed for an instant to give up his purpose in the face of this unexpected obstacle but suddenly turned and rushed furiously upon frederick seward putting a pistol to his head it missed fire and he then began beating him on the head with it tearing his scalp and fracturing his skull still struggling the two came to the secretary's room and fell together through the door frederick seward soon became unconscious and remained so for several weeks being perhaps the last man in the civilized world who learned the strange story of the night the secretary lay on the farther side of the bed from the door in the room was his daughter and a soldier nurse sergeant g f robinson they both sprang up at the noise of the disturbance payne struck them right and left out of his way wounding robinson with his knife then rushed to the bed and began striking at the throat of the crippled statesman inflicting three terrible wounds in his cheek and neck the secretary rolled off between the bed and the wall robinson had by this time recovered himself and seized the assassin from behind trying to pull him away from the bed he fought with the quickness of a cat stabbing robinson twice severely over his shoulder in spite of which the sergeant still held on to him bravely colonel augustus seward roused by his sister's screams came in his nightdress into the room and seeing the two forms in this deadly grapple thought at first his father was delirious and was struggling with the nurse but noting in a moment the size and strength of the man he changed his mind and thought that the sergeant had gone mad and was murdering the secretary nothing but madness was at first thought of anywhere to account for the night's work he seized pain and after a struggle forced him out of the door 
the assassin stabbing him repeatedly about the head and face Payne broke away at last and ran rapidly downstairs seriously wounding an attendant named hansel on the way he reached the door unhurt leaped upon his horse and rode leisurely out vermont avenue to the eastern suburb when surgical aid arrived the quiet house ordinarily so decorous and well ordered the scene of an affectionate home life and an unobtrusive hospitality looked like a field hospital five of its inmates were bleeding from ghastly wounds and two of them among the highest officials of the nation it was thought might never see the light of another day though all providentially recovered the assassin left behind him in his flight his blood-stained knife his revolver or rather the fragments of it for he had beaten it to pieces over the head of frederick seward and his hat this last apparently trivial loss cost him and one of his fellow conspirators their lives for as soon as he had left the immediate scene of his crime his perceptions being quickened by a murderer's avenging fears it occurred to him that the lack of a hat would expose him to suspicion wherever he was seen so instead of making good his escape he abandoned his horse and hid himself for two days in the woods east of washington driven by hunger he at last resolved to return to the city to the house on h street which had been the headquarters of the conspiracy he made himself a cap from the sleeve of his woolen shirt threw over his shoulder a pickaxe he had found in a trench and coming into town under cover of the darkness knocked about midnight at mrs surratt's door as his fate would have it the house was full of officers who had that moment arrested all the inmates and were about to take them to the office of the provost marshal Payne thus fell into the hands of justice and the utterance of half a dozen words by him and the unhappy woman whose shelter he had sought was the death warrant of both being asked by major smith to give an account of himself he said he had been hired by mrs surratt to dig a drain for her she was called out and asked if she knew him not being aware of what he had said she raised her right hand with uncalled for solemnity and said before god i do not know him never saw him and never hired him these words the evidence of a guilty secret shared between them started a train of evidence which led them both to the scaffold booth was recognized by dozens of people as he stood before the footlights and brandished his dripping dagger in a brutish attitude his swift horse quickly carried him beyond the reach of any haphazard pursuit he gained the navy yard bridge in a few minutes was hailed by a sentry but persuaded the sergeant of the guard that he was returning to his home in charles county and that he had waited in washington till the moon should rise he was allowed to pass and shortly afterwards harold came to the bridge and passed over with similar explanations a moment later the owner of the horse which harold rode came up in pursuit of his animal he the only honest man of the three was turned back by the guard the sergeant felt he must draw the line somewhere the assassin and his wretched acolyte came at midnight to mrs surratt's tavern booth whose broken leg was by this time giving him excruciating torture remained outside on his horse and harold went in shouting to the innkeeper to give him those things lloyd knowing what was meant without a word brought the whiskey carbines and field glass which the surrats had deposited there booth refused a gun being unable in his crippled condition to carry it harold told lloyd they had killed the president and they rode away leaving lloyd who was a sodden drunkard and contrabandist unnerved by the news 
and by his muddy perception of his own complicity in the crime he held his tongue for a day or two but at last overcome by fear told all that he knew to the authorities booth and harold pushed on through the moonlight to the house of an acquaintance of booth a rebel sympathizer a surgeon named samuel mudd the pain of his broken bone had become intolerable and day was approaching aid and shelter had become pressingly necessary mudd received them kindly set booth's leg and gave him a room where he rested until the middle of the afternoon mudd had a crutch made for him and in the evening sent them on their desolate way to the south if booth had been in health there is no reason why he should not have remained at large a good while he might even have made his escape to some foreign country though sooner or later a crime so prodigious will generally find its perpetrator out but it is easy to hide among a sympathizing people many a union soldier escaping from prison walked hundreds of miles through the enemy's country relying implicitly upon the friendship of the negroes booth from the hour he crossed the navy yard bridge though he met with a considerable number of men was given shelter and assistance by every one whose sympathies were with the south after parting company with dr mudd he and harold went to the residence of samuel cox near port tobacco and were by him given into the charge of thomas jones a contraband trader between maryland and richmond a man so devoted to the interests of the confederacy that treason and murder seemed every day incidents to be accepted as natural and necessary he kept booth and harold in hiding at the peril of his own life for a week feeding and caring for them in the woods near his house watching for an opportunity to ferry them across the potomac he did this while every woodpath was haunted by government detectives while his own neighborhood was under strong suspicion knowing that death would promptly follow his detection and that a reward was offered for the capture of his helpless charge which would make a rich man of any one who gave him up so close was the search that harold killed the horses on which they had ridden out of washington for fear a neigh might betray their hiding-place with such devoted aid booth might have wandered a long way but there is no final escape but suicide for an assassin with a broken leg at each painful move the chances of discovery increased jones was indeed able after repeated failures to row his fated guests across the potomac arriving on the virginia side they lived the lives of hunted animals for two or three days longer finding to their horror that they were received by the strongest confederates with more of annoyance than enthusiasm though none indeed offered to betray them at one house while food was given him hospitality was not offered booth wrote the proprietor a note pathetic in its attempted dignity enclosing five dollars though hard to spare for his entertainment he had by this time seen the comments of the newspapers on his work and bitterer than death or wounds was the blow to his vanity he confided his feeling of wrong to his diary i struck boldly and not as the papers say i walked with a firm step through thousands of his friends was stopped but pushed on a colonel was at his side i shouted six semper before i fired in jumping broke my leg i passed all his pickets rode sixty miles that night with the bone of my leg tearing the flesh at every jump on friday the twenty first he writes after being hunted like a dog through swamps woods and last night chased by gunboats till i was forced to return wet cold and starving with every man's hand against me i am here in despair and why for doing what brutus was honored for what made tell a hero 
he goes on comparing himself favorably with these stage heroes and adds i struck for my country and that alone a country that groaned beneath his tyranny and prayed for this end and yet now behold the cold hand they extend to me he was especially grieved that the grand eloquent letter he had entrusted to his fellow actor matthews and which he in his terror had destroyed had not been published he thought the government had wickedly suppressed it he was tortured with doubts whether god would forgive him whether it would not be better to go back to washington and clear his name i am abandoned with the curse of cain upon me when if the world knew my heart that one blow would have made me great with blessings on his mother upon his wretched companion in crime and flight upon the world which he thought was not worthy of him he closed these strange outpourings saying i do not wish to shed a drop of blood but i must fight the course the course was soon ended at port conway on the rappahannock booth and herald met three young men in confederate uniforms they were disbanded soldiers but herald imagining that they were recruiting for the southern army told them his story with perfect frankness and even pride saying we are the assassinators of the president and asked their company into the confederate lines he was disappointed at learning that they were not going south but his confidence was not misplaced the soldiers took the fugitives to port royal and tried to get shelter for them representing booth as a wounded confederate soldier after one or two failures they found refuge on the farm of a man named garrett on the road to bowling green on the night of the twenty fifth of april a party under lieutenant e p doherty arrested in his bed at bowling green william jett one of the confederate soldiers mentioned above and forced him to guide them to garrett's farm booth and herald were sleeping in the barn when called upon to surrender booth refused and threatened to shoot young garrett who had gone in to get his arms a parley took place lasting some minutes booth offered to fight the party at a hundred yards and when this was refused cried out in a theatrical tone well my brave boys prepare a stretcher for me darty then told him he would fire the barn upon this harold came out and surrendered the barn was fired and while it was burning booth who was clearly visible by the flames through the cracks in the building was shot by boston corbett a sergeant of cavalry a soldier of a gloomy and fanatical disposition which afterwards developed into insanity booth was hit in the back of the neck not far from the place where he had shot the president he lingered about three hours in great pain conscious but nearly inarticulate and died at seven in the morning the surviving conspirators with the exception of john h surratt were tried by a military commission sitting in washington in the months of may and june the charges against them specified that they were incited and encouraged to treason and murder by jefferson davis and the confederate emissaries in canada this was not proved on the trial the evidence bearing on the case showed frequent communication between canada and richmond and the booth coterie in washington and some transactions and drafts at the montreal bank where jacob thompson and booth both kept their accounts it was shown by the sworn testimony of a reputable witness that jefferson davis at greensboro on hearing of the assassination expressed his gratification at the news but this so far from proving any direct complicity in the crime would rather prove the opposite as a conscious murderer usually conceals his malice against all the rest the facts we have briefly stated were abundantly proved 
though in the case of mrs surratt the repugnance which all men feel at the execution of a woman induced the commission to unite in a recommendation to mercy which president johnson then in the first flush of his zeal against traitors disregarded habeas corpus proceedings were then resorted to and failed in virtue of the president's orders to the military in charge of the prisoners the sentences were accordingly executed mrs surratt payne harold and azerot were hanged on the seventh of july mudd arnold and o'laughlin were imprisoned for life at the tortugas though the term was afterward shortened and spangler the scene shifter at the theatre was sentenced to six years in jail john h surratt escaped to canada where he lay in hiding some months in a monastery and in the autumn sailed for england under an assumed name he wandered over europe enlisted in the papal zouaves deserted and fled to egypt where he was detected and brought back to washington in eighteen sixty seven his trial lasted two months and ended in a disagreement of the jury End of chapter 15 Recording by John Brandon